This review has been designed to prepare for the biology keystone exam. This is the third topic that we're going to be covering. So far we have covered basics of biochemistry, the cell, and this topic is covering cellular transport. So in your keystone review packet, you're looking at questions 16, 17, and 18. We'll be covering four major ways that materials can be transferred in and out of the cell. We'll talk about diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. And lastly, we'll be emphasizing the example of active transport, which is known as the sodium-potassium pump. So to start off with, before we even get into any idea about what those terms are, we need to talk a little bit about the barriers which protect cells from their external environment and these barriers that allow the passage of material through. The outermost one that certain types of cells have is called a cell wall, which you can see right here in this example. It is this green outermost structure. Cell walls are typically rigid. They tend to be porous, meaning they have holes or gaps in them, and they can be made of various materials. When we talk about plants having cell walls, such as in this picture, their cell wall is made out of a compound known as cellulose. Bacteria also have cell walls. Their cell walls can be made out of a compound known as peptidoglycan, or they can be made out of other various materials. We also have protists, which are unicellular organisms, and some are colonial or multicellular, and their cell walls can be made out of cellulose, proteins, or even silica. Our last group of organisms that do have cell walls would be our fungi, and theirs are made out of a protein known as chitin. Animals, like you and I, do not have cell walls. Because of the fact that they are porous and they have holes in them, they tend to be not terribly picky, meaning basically if an item can just fit right through that cell wall pore or hole, it's able to pass through. In addition to cell walls, we have a cell membrane. And this is a very complex picture of a cell membrane. In the last podcast, the Khan Academy one, the cell membrane was simply drawn as a straightforward little line, an outline to a cell. However, cell membranes have a lot of material in them. Sometimes they're referred to as this idea, a fluid mosaic model. Fluid because they tend to be extremely flexible. You can kind of see this curve here. And it's important that they're flexible because there's other things that cells can do to take material in and export and that flexibility helps them out. You can also see, however, there are proteins, and we'll be discussing those a little more in this podcast, and there are also sugars or polysaccharides that can help out in terms of the cell membrane. Here I wrote super picky because the cell membrane is very, very specialized and very selective of what comes in and what comes out. A good way to think about it is a nightclub bouncer. Okay, The pretty girls are allowed to come in the club. Maybe the guys can't come in because we got to get that ratio of hottie girls in there. So that's kind of what we're looking at here. Every single cell has a cell membrane. doesn't matter if it's a plant or an animal or a bacteria. They all have that cell membrane. The first topic is diffusion. As you can see in this little animation here, those blue dots are starting off clumped in the corner and then they spread on out. So that's exactly what we're looking at for diffusion. Diffusion is when molecules or any sort of compound go from an area where they're high concentration to low concentration. So a way to think about this is it's 214 on a Friday. Everybody wants to be out of the building. They want to go home to their weekend plans. So you are jam-packing yourself right by that door. That's your high concentration of students. By 2.45, you've spread out to your home. You're at the movie theater. You're getting ice cream. You're hitting up burritos, wherever you're going. At that point, you're really probably not close to the people in your classroom. So you've spread out at this point to a low concentration. Every single type of molecule goes through this. If your parents have ever baked or if you bake, you'll notice the cookies start smelling the best first in the kitchen. But even if you're all the way upstairs on the second floor, you will eventually smell those cookies. That aroma goes from an area of high concentration in the oven to a low concentration in other areas of your house. The only time they really stop, and it's not a full stop, is when they hit this idea called equilibrium. 
So you see the word equal in there. Equilibrium is at the end of this when we see the dots have kind of spread out and they're just wiggling in place. At this point, they've spread out kind of as far as they can get, and if they really spread out anymore, they would actually be closer to other molecules. But molecules are always moving. Even solids move, even liquids move. It's not just gas molecules. So they're moving, but their concentration is kind of as low as it's going to get to. Perfect examples of this in our body would be oxygen and carbon dioxide. So when we breathe in, we take that car oxygen sorry, and we store it in our lungs. What happens is it's a high concentration in our lungs and our blood cells come and our blood cells are depleted of oxygen. So they pick up, the oxygen diffuses from the lung to the blood cells. The blood cells carry the oxygen to the rest of the body and as they go from areas of high concentration in your lungs to areas of low concentration in the rest of your body, that oxygen diffuses out. On the flip side, your cells produce CO2 as a waste product of their metabolism. There is a high concentration of CO2 in your cell's waste product, so it wants to get rid of it, so it simply diffuses out. It diffuses along your body, collects in the lungs, and then whoosh, you finish that process of removal through exhalation. The neat thing about diffusion compared to some of the other processes we're going to be talking about in this podcast is that you don't need a membrane. Again, I mentioned the idea of cookies baking in an oven. You don't need a membrane for those cookie smells, those particles, to diffuse from a high concentration in the oven to a low concentration. The next idea is going to be a little important to think about. It's osmosis. And I know your mind immediately might jump to osmosis Jones, but it's not the same thing. Water, and we mentioned water in the first podcast, water is important to organisms. In fact, water is so important to organisms that we have a whole special term for just water diffusing, and we call that term here osmosis. What's important to think about here is the idea of a solute in relationship to water. So back to chemistry or if you physical chemistry, the solute is the thing that tends to dissolve. And in this case, we're looking at solutes being dissolved in water. Because solutes are either often large or as a result of dissociation, dissolving, or ionization become charged, membranes don't like to let them through. A cell membrane is made of lipids mostly. Sometimes it's referred to as a lipid bilayer. And lipids are nonpolar, ions, charge things don't go through. So when we're looking at a scenario like this, we take into account these little hexagons, these solute particles, they're not going to be able to go through this membrane, but it's important to think about them in the relationship to the water. So here is just an example. You can see on this side we have a concentrated sugar solution versus a dilute sugar solution. So sugar is represented by the red dots and water is represented by the blue dots. You see there's a dotted line here that is supposed to represent a membrane. Water, like any molecule, wants to go from a high concentration, much more blue on this side, to a low concentration. So the water is going to diffuse from this side to this side. The sugar, if it could diffuse through, would diffuse through. But if you notice in this case, the sugar molecules are too big to fit through these holes, the water ones could, the sugar can't move. So if you notice, the sugar molecules are the same in this picture, the before and the after both times. However, the water molecules move through. And what we see is there ends up being more water molecules in the end than there was to start with. And at this point, water will continue to go back and forth but it's reached equilibrium. It's not going to continue to raise the height on this side. That's what we're looking for for osmosis, the diffusion of water through a selectively permeable membrane. Now, what we do is this concept is so important as we break it down into three scenarios. What happens if a cell is placed into an environment, so the outside of the cell, that has lots of water? What happens if a cell is placed into an environment that has little, little, little water, but lots of solute? What happens if a cell is placed into an environment that has the same amount of water, the same concentrations of solute as the inside of the cell? So we're going to refer to these as the three tonics because there's a hypotonic, a hypertonic, and an isotonic. So again, what we're going to be looking at is the water molecules in these instances. It's important to think about the solute, the pink dots, but the pink dots can't move through the membrane, so we're really focusing on the water.
The first one I want to focus on is hypotonic. And then remember this, I say hypo, and O rhymes with low. So in a hypotonic environment, outside the cell, we have low solute. But remember, we don't care about the solute as much. We just want to think about the solute in relationship to water. So if the solute is low, the water is going to be high. They're always going to be opposite. It tends to look something like this. Now I know it's a crazy, crazy diagram, but yellow is just showing you the cell. Again, solute is pink, just showing you there's low hypotonic, low solute outside, high concentration of water outside. And we know molecules want to go from an area of high concentration to an area of low concentration. Solutes can't move. We don't care what happens to the pink dots. We're focused on what's happening to the water. The water is going to move from high concentration to low concentration. So what actually ends up happening is my water is going to move into the cell. Now, if you are a plant cell or an animal cell, you get a slightly different fate or what happens to you. Plant cells actually love this. Think about it. If you water a plant, you're watering it with pure water. You're not giving it salt water. You're not giving it sugar water. You're not giving it super potent water. It's just pure water. The reason that plants like this is plants have this little guy here, and that's a vacuole. And remember from our last podcast, vacuole is something that stores material. In this case, their watered vacuole will store water. So what happens is a plant cell will just suck up all that extra water and suck it up and suck it up and get puffy and puffy and bigger. And you can notice that's why this is slightly rounded. It's a puffy fat cell and we call it turgid. The reason it won't pop is because plants have a cell wall outside of their cell membrane. And their cell wall is like a mesh cage. It allows it to expand, but it can't break or burst. However, an animal cell does not have a cell wall. So if an animal cell is placed in a hypotonic environment, water is going to rush in and in and in and in, and the cell will pop or burst open. So that's why I have my smiley face here. Plants love a hypotonic environment. Franny face here. Animals will die in a hypotonic environment. The second one that I'm going to talk about is a hypertonic environment. Think about if you're hyper, you're on a sugar high. You've had tons of candy, pixie sticks, whatever, and you're kind of bouncing around on sugar. Sugar is a perfect example of a solute. So in a hypertonic environment, it's going to be a high amount of solute. But again, we don't really care about the solute as much as we care about the water. Solute and water are always going to be opposite. So if I have a high solute concentration, I'll have a low water concentration outside of the cell. It looks something like this. Very, very different than the last picture. I see tons of pink solute dots on the outside, not too many on the inside. But again, we're focusing on the water. I see inside the cell, there's a high water concentration, but hypotonic, I'm sorry, hypertonic high solute outside. High concentration of water wants to go from high to low. So what happens in this case is the water is going to flow right outside of the cell. Again, if you're an animal cell or a plant cell, it's a little different. So a plant cell, this is bad news bears. We call it plasmolysis. What happens is that water vacuole, that thing that holds the water and stores it, empties out, empties out, empties out. And what you can see, this little spider looking guys actually the cell membrane the cell membrane is collapsing in on itself because it's losing all of that liquid frowny face this is not good the exact same thing happens in an animal cell so these are red blood cells instead of having their normal donut shape all the water is leaving them they get all shriveled and crinky dink and it's not that good so for this case neither a plant cell nor an animal cell wants to be in a hypertonic environment. The last one is an isotonic environment. An iso is just a Latin Greek prefix meaning same. Think of an isosceles triangle. An isosceles triangle has two of the same angle, two of the same size. Iso means same. So in an isotonic environment, what it means is the water concentration 
and the solute concentration are the same on the inside and the outside of the cell. So you can see in this picture, it's the same on the inside and it's the same on the outside. Instead of seeing one arrow going in or one arrow going out, you see these double arrows. Because like I mentioned in diffusion, just because a molecule hits equilibrium, where the concentration is the same, does not mean that molecule stops. Molecules move. They're constantly bouncing around, spinning around. So what you're going to see here is the concentrations will stay the same. Maybe this molecule comes in, that one comes out. This water molecule goes in, that one goes out. They will move, but the concentrations will be the same. Now for a plant and animal, again, we're going to look at what happens to each one. So in a plant cell, this is when they start to wilt. They haven't completely gotten to that stage where plasmolysis takes place. Their cell membrane hasn't completely collapsed. But you'll notice they are much more square shaped than they were when they were turgid. And that water vacuole has gotten much smaller. Because normally they want to be filling, filling, filling with water. But here for every amount of water that goes in, the same amount goes out. I have kind of an intermediate phase here. For an animal cell, this is our happy place. This is exactly where an animal cell wants to be. Think about homeostasis. For animals, they want the concentrations to be the same on the inside and the outside. If you ever get really, really sick and you end up in the hospital, they give you an IV drip. They don't give you a pure water drip. They give you an IV drip that's got salt and sugar concentrations that are what your body should be at. If I were to inject you with pure water, that would be lethal to you because your cells would burst open. So we want that kind of in-between, isotonic, same solute, same water, inside-outside cell. So those take care of osmosis, which again was just looking at the diffusion of water across the cell membrane. We also have facilitated diffusion. So if we're talking about diffusion, we're still thinking about the idea of going from a high concentration to a low concentration. But in this case, these are some of our clunkier molecules. I call them the large in charge usually. And what happens is they can't fit through these teeny tiny spaces in the cell membrane. The way that oxygen and the way that CO2 go through is they're small and they're nonpolar. They're not detected. They just zip on through. These guys can't fit through the physical door or the opening. So what happens is there are helper proteins that come in. And it's called facilitated diffusion because facilitate just means help. So there are special proteins that are embedded in the cell membrane and they help the materials go through. Glucose is a perfect example. We need glucose. Every single one of our cells needs sugar, but glucose can't diffuse through on its own. It has helper proteins come in. So this just kind of compares the two. Both simple and facilitated diffusion are going through that um, a membrane system, this one can just shoot right on through the membrane. However, in facilitated diffusion, you need this port protein to come through. In simple diffusion, again, my small, my nonpolar, they just zip right through unnoticed. And again, facilitated are my big ticket items, my large and charged molecules. Oh, here is a picture of what facilitated diffusion could look like. So I have my outside of my cell and my inside of my cell. These squares are representing my item, perhaps it's glucose, and they are too large to just zip through. If I were talking about CO2 or oxygen, they would be like the teeny tiny tip of my pointer. They would actually just fit right through. These purple guys are the proteins. And again, my glucose molecules want to go from a high concentration, in this case it's outside of the cell, to a low concentration inside of the cell. So what you'll notice is proteins are based on shape. And we talked about that in our first podcast. The shape of a protein determines its function. So this little square guy fits in this little square hole. And what happens is when that happens, there's a shape change. The protein recognizes the thing that wants to come through. It changes its shape and it pops the guy out on the other side. If I were a heart-shaped molecule, I would not be able to fit into this receptor and I wouldn't be able to go through. So it's very specific. If this square is glucose, only glucose can get through. No other molecule can. Here's just another example. So there's two different styles. There's the carrier protein, still a protein, or a pore. Pore means that it has to fit the shape at first and then it's like a little straw or tube and it kind of just shoots on down. Your carrier protein again will change shape. 
So I have my little triangle here. In either case, the triangle is not going to match the pore opening, and the triangle certainly is going to fit into that carrier protein, so that triangle molecule, whatever it is, can't go through. Our last method that we're going to talk about of getting materials across a cell membrane, whether into the cell or outside of the cell, is called active transport. And active transport is a little bit of the black sheep of the family because everyone else, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion, they all go from a high concentration to a low concentration, and we call that a concentration gradient. Active transport actually goes against the concentration gradient, so they go from a low concentration to a high concentration. So you can see here there are far fewer pluses than over here, and they're showing you the red one. This is not easy for the cell to do. It would be like pushing a boulder uphill or rowing upstream. It's something that is not easy to do, so what happens is we actually need help. And we need help in the form of cellular energy, and we need help from this guy who's known as ATP. You can see here, ATP is really, really important energy molecule. We're going to talk about it in more detail in future podcasts, but what you just need to know is this guy has energy. Active transport is going to be used anytime you have a large charged molecule that's trying to again go against its concentration gradient. So a really good example is ions. Ions are definitely charged molecules. Ions are extremely not friendly with a regular nonpolar cell membrane, so they are going to need to get through with the help of a protein, and they're typically going against their concentration gradient, so they will need ATP or energy. Here is a picture of active transport. So I can see in this case, this is the inside of the cell, and this is the outside of the cell. I see a low concentration here, and I see a high concentration here. So in active transport, I'm going to be going from low to high. So you can see right here, step one is going to happen. Um, they're showing you that my molecule, my ion, whatever it is, is going to want to bond here. Then you see my ATP in the form of energy. What the energy does is it goes through, it changes the shape. So right now it's closed off to the outside. Once the ATP comes in, it changes the shape. Now it's open to the outside. And my little molecule can go from the inside of the cell, from a low concentration, to the outside of a cell, to a higher concentration. A really good example of this is the sodium-potassium pump. So when we think of sodium, we're not talking about sodium metal or potassium metal. We're talking about the ionized forms of these. Sodium-potassium pump is really important in the human body and most organisms. It helps create an electrical gradient. And what that does is we cause a difference in the charge inside of a cell and outside of the cell. And it does this by moving sodium ions and potassium ions. Both of them get moved against their concentration gradients. So what happens is in a natural way, you can see here sodium is shown in the little red in the hexagons. And potassium is shown in yellow. So my sodium is actually going to be going from the, this side to that side. And my potassium is going from that side to this side and it creates a sort of concentration gradient and an electrical charge gradient, which is really important for cells to function. To help illustrate this better, there's an animation on McGraw-Hill that I'm going to show, and it does a great job of explaining exactly step-by-step step what's happening with the sodium-potassium pump. The potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel, and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell, and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions, and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel, and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape, and as a result, the potassium ions are released inside the cell. 
In its original shape, the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions, and when these ions bind again, they initiate another cycle. The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. That is to say, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. So here are just some pictures that will compare our different modes that we've talked about. So we have simple diffusion, which we mentioned. Osmosis isn't shown in this picture. Facilitated diffusion, which we mentioned. And active transport, which we mentioned. You'll notice both of these are bracketed off as passive transport. And that just means that it's a passive process. It's not requiring energy because it goes from a high concentration to a low concentration. Our active transport, again, is going against the concentration gradient, so from low to high, and that is going to require energy in the form of ATP. So you can see here, simple diffusion is going to be a small particle moving from a high concentration to a low concentration, nonpolar molecule, and it's able to simply go through a pore, a hole, an opening in the cell membrane straight across. Facilitated diffusion is when a molecule is too big to go through the cell membrane on its own, or it could be charged or polar. So in this case, it needs the help of a carrier protein. And again, it's shape dependent. It has to match the shape of the protein, and then it will travel on through to the next side. Our active transport goes from low to high, and it requires energy in the form of ATP, and it has to also go through a transport protein. Just another picture showing you them. So we have our passive diffusion, just regular diffusion, oxygen going straight through. We have facilitated diffusion, helping out with the protein to carry them through. And we have active transport going from a, high, a low concentration gradient to a high concentration. They're showing you again that sodium potassium pump and we need ATP or cellular energy involved. So to sum up the concept of this podcast, cellular transport is a way to get materials into the cell or out of the cell, and we do that in these four different ways. We have diffusion, osmosis, facilitated diffusion, and active transport. Instead of trying to memorize everything and the whole chart, what I tell my students is just to focus on the weirdos. So if I look over here, there is only one type that actually requires energy, active transport. So just remember, active transport requires energy, none of the others do. Over here, diffusion is the only process that doesn't technically require a cell membrane. In the case that we are talking about, about getting materials in and out of the cell, it would, but you can't have active transport occur in the air like you can diffusion. So just remember that one and you're good to go. In terms of concentration, diffusion, osmosis, and facilitated diffusion all go with or along the concentration gradient from a high concentration to a low concentration. Just remember the weirdo, the act of transport goes from low to high. And in this case, large and charged, large and charged. Osmosis is really weird because it only moves water and diffusion moves small and nonpolar compounds.